Hi, everyone. My name is David Feidler. I'm the editor of the Living Ideas Journal, and I'm also the editor of Stoic Insights. And it's my pleasure today to be speaking with Massimo Pellucci, the K.D. Arani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. Massimo is the author of many books, and today we'll be discussing his latest work, uh, the Quest for Character, what the story of Socrates and Alcibiades teaches us about the search for good leaders. So welcome, Massimo, and it's uh, great to be speaking with you again. It's a pleasure to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Great. So um, in short, could you uh, tell us what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, I was always inspired and you know and and uh, stunned i guess by alcibiades life the the uh, initial um, prompt for this project was actually alcibiades himself and then literally expanded to other characters and you know broader theme but i'm i'm still surprised that nobody has made a movie out of the life of alcibiades at least none that that i know of because the guy was just incredible right it he was uh, impossibly handsome, uber rich, brave, dashing. He, you know, he had everything you would pass of, of noble descent. He had everything you wanted in a human being, except, of course, the only thing that mattered in order to become a, a good statesman in general, and that was a good character. <laughs> and so the story goes that he went to Socrates. You know, Alcibiades was very young. In his early twenties, uh, Socrates was in his forties, and uh, they were friends. And and uh, uh, Alcibiades was, in a sense, uh, Socrates' student. And he goes to Socrates and says, "You know, I want to become a leader of Athens. I want to introduce myself to the assembly. What do you think?" And basically, what follows this is in the Alcibiades Maya, which is attributed to Plato, although there is some doubt that Plato actually wrote that dialogue. But regardless who who wrote it, it's a, it's an interesting dialogue. Because Socrates basically puts Alcibiades through a what we would today call a job interview. And it doesn't go very well. Because it turns out, of course, that Alcibiades is full of hubris, is is into self-aggrandizing, he's a narcissist. And, and so at the end of it, um, Socrates tells him, and, and I'm quoting you on this, then alas, Alcibiades, what a condition you suffer from. I hesitate to name it, but it must be said, you are wedded to stupidity, best of men, of the most extreme sort, as the argument accuses you and you accuse yourself. So this is why you are leaping into the affairs of the city before you have been educated. And it's like, ouch, <laughs> right? <laughs> Your mentor tells you something like that. Um, you would think that the, the, the young man would have been crushed. But of course, it does exactly the opposite. It goes into politics. It does become a general, and it's a mess um, the, from then po that point on. So the story kind of inspired me to look into the broader issue of the relationship between ethics and politics, and that's that's what the book is about. Right. I remember uh, we were in a group speaking uh, maybe a little over a year ago, and you brought up the question of politics, and everyone was uh, very shy to say something about it because you know, speaking about politics now has become so uh, partisan as well as polarizing. But I remember I raised a question in that group and I said, um, you know, I really don't understand why we don't have uh, better political leaders to choose from. And that seems to actually be uh, one of the main themes of the book as well. Yeah, it is. And you're absolutely right that people are getting shy. Even some of my own students in philosophy classes, uh, you know, I asked them about what they, what they think about politics and say, oh, we, we never talk about politics with other people, or with our relatives, because then people, you know, everybody gets upset. And I said, well, that's confusing politics with partisanship. Of course, partisanship upsets people, because if you start talking, you know, about the particular candidate or a particular uh, party, then people get immediately defensive of that person or that party. But talking about politics in the general sense of what is good for the police, that is what is good for society, you would think that that's a topic that everybody should be interested in. But but you're right, it's a, it's a delicate one. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, to, to I think, approach it from the point of view of the Greco-Romans, not, not only because these people had a lot of interesting things to say that still 
hold today. But because presumably, you know, if I started talking about somebody, if I wrote a book uh, where I named names of modern contemporary politicians, then then I would immediately lose half of the audience because it would become uh, about partisanship. But I'm hoping, I'm counting that that not many people have strong opinions about Alcibiades or or, or about Nero or or about Cato the Younger, and so that they're more willing to listen to the underlying dynamics and what generates those dynamics. Right. Well, this uh, question of why we don't have better political candidates, I think uh, your book illustrates quite well that this is actually a perennial question that goes back, you know, well over 2000 years. And it's obviously a question uh, or it should be a question on a lot of people's minds today. So I'm really glad that uh, you've addressed this question in such a beautiful way. Uh, so in this book, uh, you're talking about the quest for character. And uh, naturally, uh, you would start off by discussing the four cardinal virtues, which go back to Plato. And those are prudence uh, or wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice. And those were very important to the Stoic philosophers too. But one thing that I found to be very interesting is you mentioned a study conducted by some psychologists, and they found that these uh, four cardinal virtues are nearly universal across uh, human cultures. And I'm wondering, why do you think that's uh, the case? Yeah, that's a good question, right? I was a little bit surprised as well, because especially contemporary debate about uh, ethics is often cast in terms of some version of relativism, right? So even, even from my own colleagues in a philosophy department, I hear often things like, well, you know, different cultures are different, and, you know, who are you to criticize uh, another culture? And, you know, beware of the specter of, of uh, you know, white men, self-entitlement, and that sort of, all that sort of stuff. And those are reasonable warnings. It is certainly the case that for a long time, white men, uh, white men have been self-entitled, and it's certainly, you know, colonialism is certainly an issue, etc. But at the same time, do we really want to say that whatever another culture does is fine just because it's a different culture? So we want to say that, you know, uh, to come up with the obvious examples, genital mutilation of young girls is okay because it's not part of my culture. Do we want to say that the Rwandan genocide was okay because, you know, it wasn't me that I was doing it. It was a different culture. Maybe they settled the, the, their disagreements by genocide. I don't think so. I don't think anybody really believes that. I I met a lot of relativists or the people who claim to be relativists, but I never met an, met an actual relativist because it turns out that if you start talking about things at one point or another, uh, they, you know, people will react by saying, no, that's not, that's not right. Or that's not, that shouldn't be done. Well, on what basis are you saying that that's not right if you profess to be a relativist? So this idea that the virtues or the concept of virtue, and in fact, some of the specific virtues appear to be universal or near universal across human cultures is interesting because it is a piece of empirical evidence in favor of the notion that human ethics might not actually be as relative as uh, some people uh, pretend that, that it is. So that research is interesting because it highlights essentially six virtues that appear to be near universal, at least in literate cultures, so cultures capable of writing, although more recent research seems to be, follow-up research seems to show that even in non-literate cultures, there are similar concepts. Four of those six are the ones that you just mentioned, basically the one version or another of the four cardinal virtues of Plato and, and the Greco-Romans. So that's interesting right there, because it makes the Greco-Romans into not just the Greco-Romans, but into something a little bit more universal. Of course, I should say, to be fair, that there is variation in the emphasis that different cultures put on, on one or the other of these uh, virtues. So, so it's not like everybody believes exactly the same things, but ballpark is, is close enough. The additional two are interesting because they're, um, modern psychologists refers to them as um, transcendence and humanity. And the Stoics, I think, had both. But they didn't call them virtues. They didn't count them under the, under the virtues. Humanity is uh, translates to what the Stoics refer to as cosmopolitanism. So this notion that we are all part of the human family, we're all connected, regardless of whether you actually know people directly or not, regardless of whether they're members of your family or they live on the other side of the planet, there is something common ab about the fact that we are all human beings. 
So that's number five. And then number six, transcendence, is uh, the notion that we are connected not just to other human beings, but to the cosmos in general, that we, we are not disconnected from the universe at large. We're bits and pieces of the universe at large. And of course, the Stoics did have that concept. That's because they were pantheists. So they they thought that the universe is endowed with the logos, whatever that means specifically. We can leave that for another discussion. But we are literally bits and pieces of the universal logos. The reason we're we're rational beings, or at least capable of rationality, is precisely because we are not disconnected from the rest of the cosmos. So a lot of you know some of the uh, even the, some of the spiritual, ex- spiritual exercises that the Stoics uh, practice, like uh, the sunrise meditation that you find in Marcus Aurelius's meditations, which actually predates the Stoics, it goes back to the Pythagoreans. That's one way to remember that you are connected to nature at large. So these six appear to be pretty much a constant, and uh, and and they're found everywhere. And that, to me. Uh, is an important way of validating the fact that when we talk about the Greco-Romans, we're not just talking about a specific, we are obviously talking about a specific culture and time, but uh, what we value about that specific culture and time is actually universal, is actually applies to universal in the sense of human universal. I'm not claiming any kind of Kantian universalism of, you know, an absolute sense of, of universal morality. I don't believe that for a minute, but I do believe that there are commonalities at the level of human beings, at the level of uh, the human species that are important. Right. And you can find all six of those in Plato as well. They were all very strong, yeah. Plato as well as the Stoics. Mm-hmm. Now, when we go back to the original study of uh, ethics or virtue, in the Western world, we end up with Socrates, and he thought that excellence of character was actually a form of knowledge. And because of that, and of course, we're using uh, character and virtue basically as synonyms in this discussion. Um, But Socrates felt that excellence of character or virtue was in some way teachable. And what I'm wondering is, uh, do you think that's true? And if you do think that's true, why is excellence of character so often uh, seemingly lacking in our political leaders uh, yeah. who often uh, s- say one thing and do another? Right. Yeah, those are excellent questions. So, yes, first of all, Socrates sometimes is of two minds about this issue, right? In the Mino, for instance, he seems to conclude that teach that the virtue cannot be taught. And his reasoning is, look, virtue is a very important thing. And you would think that if it could be taught, you would see a lot of teachers out there. And I don't see a lot of teachers, he says, so it must be that it can't be taught. But in the Protagoras, he changes his mind. And he changes his mind, interestingly, in response to an argument by Protagoras, who is a sophist, and uh, and I find that very interesting. Essentially, uh, what Socrates and Protagoras in the end uh, arrive at, the conclusion that they arrive at, is that virtue is not a theoretical type of knowledge. It's not the kind of thing that, let's say, like quantum mechanics, that you can sit down, learn from a book, and then you say, oh, yeah, I understand virtue. That's it. That, I'm done. It's a technique. So it's a it's a skill. In fact, Protagoras makes the analogy, which I think is very good, between virtue and learning to play a musical instrument, let's say a flute, for instance. Now, the question is, you know, so how do you how do you learn how to play a musical instrument? Well, you need three things. You need a little bit of theory. It, it's a good idea to have knowledge of, you know, the different notes and, and how they relate to each other. You know, a little bit of, uh, of theory is, is, is a good thing. Ideally, you need a good teacher who is pointing out to you where you're making mistakes. It's making suggestions about how to improve your technique, et cetera, et cetera. And then, however, mostly what you what you need is practice, 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 right? So you start little simple scales, and then you get more complicated. You start with little tunes, and then you get more complicated. You do that every day for hours a day, and then you get more and more proficient. The idea is that virtue works in a similar way. You want a little bit of theory. For instance, 
thinking of virtue in terms of the of the four cardinal ones is a bit of theory. Uh, thinking, uh, you know, whether you agree or not with Socrates, for instance, about the unity of virtues, the, the notion that the four virtues are actually all four aspects of the same fundamental thing, let's say wisdom in the broad sense, or not, that's theory. Ideally, you need a Socrates or a Seneca or a Plato or somebody who helps you helps you out uh, navigating your way through the virtues. But most of, mostly, what you need is, in fact, the practice. And then the question becomes: Okay, it's clear enough, I think, how you practice a musical instrument, but how do you practice virtue? And the ancient Greco Romans were actually pretty generous about giving us su suggestions about this, right? The so-called spiritual exercises that Pierre Hadot talks about in in um, a couple of his books are essentially ways to practice virtue for instance if you look at um, musonius rufus who was a, a first century stoic philosopher he was the uh, teacher of epictetus what does he say he says well take temperance which is one of the four cardinal virtues how do you practice temperance oh well you got three three chances every day every every time you sit down for a meal that's your practice for temperance because you start paying attention, as we would say today, perhaps you are mindful about what you're eating, where do, where what you're eating comes from, how much you're eating it, how you're sharing it with other people, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are uh, chances to uh, practice temperance because you want to be mindful and, and self-control, exercise self-control on the quality and quantity of your food. And that's one way in which you practice virtue. Let's say, for instance, you want to practice generosity. Well, one way, to, there are many ways, but one way to do that might be to get into the habit of uh, putting some pocket change uh, in, your, in your pocket in, uh, before you go and you, you leave the house and then just give it to the first uh, homeless person you see in the streets. No questions asked. Now, initially, that might feel awkward. You might feel like, the hell am I doing here? Is this even the right thing to do? But after you start doing it on a regular basis, it becomes second nature. So the, the notion is that the more you do it, the more you become virtuous. In a sense, it's really kind of faking until you make it. Uh, <laughs> you're not really faking it, but you are in initially forcing yourself, you're pushing yourself to do something that doesn't come natural. And then eventually, with repetition, as Aristotle would say, uh, it does become natural, become second nature. Right. And another thing uh, that you mentioned in the book, too, which is a point that Seneca kept uh, coming back to, is that if you want to develop a good character, it's quite helpful to have role models that you can look up to. Right. Right. And Seneca, the, the, that, the particular quote by Seneca is one of my favorite because it says it, uh, that um, – in order to see how crooked you are, you need a straight ruler to compare yourself with, right? So uh, the role model is the straight ruler, ruler, and and you realize by comparing yourself to your model, to the role model, you realize just how far you are from the from straightness, and so how much you have to go, how far you have to go. Now the role model doesn't have to be somebody who is perfect, and we're not talking about the sage here, although. I guess that could be one role model, but there are not many sages around, even according to Seneca himself. In another bit, he says that uh, the sage is as rare as the phoenix, which according to um, Roman mythology, uh, you know, this is the classic, the, 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 the bird that rises from his, its ashes only happens once every 500 years. So there are not a lot of sages out, out there. But there are people who might inspire you in terms of their behavior, in, in terms of how you want to be yourself. And those could be famous people that you know or don't know, but it could be also your grandmother, or it could be, you know, any anybody that um, even modern psychologists shows, if you train yourself, when you, especially when you're about to make decisions about ethically salient matters, if you train yourself to think about your role models and basically, basically ask yourself, what would my grandmother do under those conditions? you tend to behave in a more ethical fashion. And this is something that a lot of cultures have discovered, right? If you go in the American South, for instance, you would see a lot of people wearing a bracelet that has the inscription WWJD, what would Jesus do, right? That's a, that's a version of the same thing. Now, the problem with Jesus is that he's a God, so he's a perfect role model. <laughs> and so that's raising the bar a lot. Uh, I prefer to think of Epictetus as my role model. <laughs> so I, I ask myself, you know, what would Epictetus do here? 
and uh, and the answer does guide your own actions in that in that fashion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, could you tell us a bit about the story uh, about Socrates and Alcibiades, and why were they interested in one another? Uh, how did they differ from one another? And yeah. ultimately, you have a very uh, complex account because it's a complicated story. But could you tell us also how Alcibiades uh, ended up turning against Athens? Yeah, it, it is a complicated story. As I said, somebody should make a movie out of this. And uh, they were, as I said, um, they had a complex relationship in terms of friendship, mentorship, and, and, uh, and you know, mentor and student. They're rumored to be lovers, although it's pretty clear from Plato's Symposium that they were not, that uh, Alcibiades wanted to be <laughs> Socrates' lover, you know, physical love, lover, and Socrates was only interested in Alcibiades' soul. But that raises yet another question. Why was Socrates interested in Alcibiades' soul since Socrates so saw so clearly that Alcibiades was a deeply flawed human being? So it's it's really kind of kind of complicated but Socrates did like to surround himself with young people that he wanted to influence he thought that that was a major way for him to help the city of Athens of course in the end we know that that was one of the two uh, charges that were raised against him at, at his trial the corruption of the youth right uh, and uh, which in modern terms just means teaching. <laughs> if you're teaching, you're trying to, in a certain way, you're you're trying, in fact, to corrupt the youth in, in, in a sense. Alcibiades himself was in, an incredible uh, character. I mean, he was, in fact, brilliant. He was a brilliant general, and he did win a lot of, of battles, uh, both on land and on, uh, on at, at sea for on behalf of Athens. But the problem is that he was inconstant, and he was mostly about self-aggrandizing. And so his main interest was himself, not the city of Athens. So, for instance, what he did, uh, right before the uh, the Athenian ill-fated expedition against Syracuse in um, in Sicily, the Athenians at one point decided that this is in the middle of the Peloponnesian War against Sparta. The Athenians thought that it was a good idea to open a second front and try to conquer all of Sicily. And that was a big gamble, which, in fact, Alcibiades pushed in the Athenian assembly. Arguably, that's one of the major reasons in the end why Athens lost the Peloponnesian War, because the Athenian expedition was, in fact, a complete disaster. But Alcibiades was put in charge, together with two other generals of the expedition. However, there was also this bizarre incident uh, right before the, the expedition launched. Uh, in the middle of the night, uh, somebody, we, we don't really know who, uh, disfigured a number of sacred statues, the Hermes, uh, throughout Athens. And Alcibiades was suspected. Alcibiades and his friends, who were known for pranks of that sort, were suspected uh, of having done the deed. Nevertheless, he was let go to um, Syracuse and, you know, start the expedition. But then he was recalled. A, a ship was sent to uh, recall him and arrest him and bring him back uh, to Athens to stand for trial. And he, he knew this, and so he defects. So he, he leaves the Athenian army and defects to Sparta, you know, the arch enemy of Athens. Not only by seeking asylum, which would have been kind of understandable because uh, Alcibiades' family actually was the um, representatives, had uh, historically been the represent representative of, of the Athenians in Sparta. So he did have connection in Sparta. So that, it would have been okay, I, I, I suppose, for him to seek asylum. He doesn't just seek asylum. He actually starts advising the Spartans on how to defeat the Athenians and in a very effective manner, <laughs> among other things. So he wasn't just pretending to advise people. So clearly that generated a significant amount of, you know, of, of, of uh, uh, negative reactions on the Athenians' part. When he's in Athens, he thinks it's a, somehow it's a good idea to seduce the Spartan queen and get her pregnant, which, of course, is not going to be well received by the Spartan king, one <laughs> of the two Spartan kings. There, there were the, the Spartans had two kings. And so now he's kicked out of Sparta. What does he do? He defects once again, this time to Persian, which was the the common enemy of Sparta and Athens, and he starts advising the Persians on how to defeat both the, the Athenians and the Spartans. So this thing keeps going on. At some point, somehow, he manages to convince the Athenians to recall him after the, the disaster of the 
Sicilian expedition, Athens is desperate for some kind of savior. And so the, somebody figures out, okay, let's recall Alcibiades. He gets recalled to the city. And sure enough, he gets back in charge. He is responsible for a series of, you know, string of defeats of the of the Spartans, so much so that it begins to look like Athens might actually win the Peloponnesian War despite the disaster in in Sicily. But then of course he makes a, you know, minor mistake. He loses a minor uh, encounter and the fickle Athenian dem democracy, the fickle Athenian assembly just kicks him out again, takes him takes out his command. He, he leaves, he goes into exile this time for the last time by that time he has pissed off enough people that the spartans actually ask this the the um, persians to go after him and and finally kill him and that's what happens he's surrounded in his in a house a temporary housing that he had in the mountains and uh uh he's, he's surrounded by by spies by by uh, persian soldiers he comes out of his house naked with, with his shield and his sword in hand and you know yelling his battle cry. And people are so afraid of him that nobody wants to actually engage him in one-to-one -one combat. And finally he's killed by a you know a cloud of arrows. So it's an incredible life. And in all of this, he has uh, interacted with Socrates a number of times. At one point, Socrates saves Alcibiades' life in battle. Because you know, we we think of Socrates as the philosopher, but he was actually in three of the three of the major major battles in the Peloponnesian War, and apparently fought with a certain amount of distinction um, in all three of them. In one of them, even even saves Alcibiades' life. So it's a really complex relationship, and it's it's fascinating in its own right, even even uh, outside of what it tells us more generally about the relationship between ethics and and politics, and about statesmanship. It's just a, a fascinating story. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Socrates ever gave up on Alcibiades, or did Socrates hold out some hope that he might be uh, redeemable in terms of developing a better character? That's a good question. Uh, if you read Plato's Symposium, at least the way I read it, it sounds to me like Socrates is pretty close to giving up on Alcibiades. In fact, he's he's, a, he's even afraid at one point of of Alcibiades uh, physically assaulting him, and and he asks the, his host uh, at the symposium, just like just get this this guy away from me because he's a, he's a dangerous kind of guy. But he does also at the same time claim that he loves Alcibiades. He loves Alcibiades, however, in the, and in fact, he uses the word eros. But the word eros, uh, although we today understand it as erotic, as in, in, in terms of sort of sexual uh, contact and pleasure, uh, it really meant a broad range of things in, in ancient uh, Greek. And in fact, uh, Socrates uses that word to then launch into an explanation of what erotic love really is, and it's the love of the idea of beauty itself, right? Uh, the problem with that reading of the symposium is that, that the, the classical problem when you read Plato, that is, you never know where Socrates ends and where Plato begins. Uh, when, if, if we're talking about the idea of love, that clearly is a reference to Plato's theories of forms. And there is no evidence that, so that that's a Socrates theory. It really is Plato. And uh, so the symposium is one of the middle dialogues where the distinction between Socrates and Plato is particularly blurred so much so that some modern commentators refer to the the resulting hybrid as platsock it's like you have no idea how to separate the the, the two I would right. think that you know in the real in the real world I would think that at some point Socrates realized that you know Alcibiades was be beyond hope especially once he started with once he uh, left Athens and started going around, you know, making a lot of mess uh, throughout the Mediterranean area, then uh, then at that point, probably Socrates gave up. Right. So uh, Plato's, you know, earliest dialogues seem to be, you know, relatively faithful in terms of uh, representing Socrates and his method and ideas. But as time goes on, Plato begins to use him as a mouthpiece for his own ideas. That's at least the, the theory that a lot of scholars seem to subscribe to. And it, the, the reason for that, there are multiple reasons for, for thinking that way. One is internal style and the kind of ideas that are that are that emerge 
in the early dialogues as compared to the middle or late dialogues. For instance, in the Republic, it's pretty clear, which is also a middle dialogue, it's pretty clear that we're listening now to Plato mostly, not, not to Socrates. But there is enough of a root of Socratic ideas there that Socrates still plays a major major uh, role. In the Laws, which is a later dialogue by Plato, Socrates basically doesn't appear. It's, it's just not, it's not, not even a character in the dialogue. One other reason to think that the early dialogues are more representative of the historical Socrates is because we do have some other sources about Socrates, the major one of which is Xenophon. Xenophon was a general, not a philosopher, although actually he was probably a philosopher, a general. It's kind of, you know, there was not that, there wasn't that kind of sharp distinction between those roles that, that we, we seem to imply today. But mostly he's, he's remembered as a, as a general. And so he had probably less of a philosophical agenda than Plato. He did write four Socratic dialogues, the most famous of which is the Memorabilia, which inspired, in, among other things, Zeno of Cytum to get, you know, the founder of Stoicism to get into philosophy in the first place. And if you compare the Socrates from Xenophon to the early Platonic dialogues, you can you can reasonably arrive at the conclusion that we're we're li- really looking at the same person. That that it's pretty much, although there are some differences in emphasis. The I I actually find as much as I love the Platonic dialogues, I find Xenophon far more entertaining than Plato. He's, uh, he's, his Socrates is much more alive. He, you know, he talks to people uh, of all sorts, not just the usual suspects. Uh, you know, there is a, a dialogue, for instance, in the memorabilia where, he, where Socrates gives um, business advice to a famous courtesan, and uh, you don't you don't find that kind of stuff in Plato. Plato is just not interested in that sort of thing. Right. Uh, one of the things that made the book really interesting to me personally is that uh, it's not just about the story of Socrates and Alcibiades, but instead you actually cover a long history of philosophers who tried to help create more virtuous leaders. So uh, you start off with Socrates and Alcibiades, but then you also consider Plato and Dionysius II in southern Italy, and then Aristotle and uh, Alexander the Great, you consider Seneca and Nero, and uh, you included a very good commentary on Seneca's writing uh, on clemency or on mercy, which he wrote in an effort to improve the moral character of the Emperor Nero. So I really enjoyed all those other sections of uh, the book as well. Yeah, the the general idea there is that there are two chapters that that, um, uh, go into a lot of case studies of that kind that you just mentioned. And there are two major categories, right? There's one group of uh, case studies where a philosopher from the outside tries to influence uh, a a statesman or a wannabe statesman. So those are the cases of Socrates and Alcibiades, of course. Although Xenophon tells us of several other cases in which Socrates himself advises other people. He advises Glaucon and Carmides and Euthydemus to either go or not go into, into politics. So Socrates has done that a number of times. Plato did it three times with Dionysus I of Syracuse, with Dionysus II of Syracuse, and then with Dion, who was a student of Plato. So there are cases where a philosopher tries to influence a statesman, and then there are cases where the statesman or general politician himself has studied philosophy of his own account. That is, he has actually sought philosophical advice. So one one situation is the philosopher goes to the statesman. The other is the statesman goes to the goes to the philosopher. To simplify things a little bit, and if you compare most of those the, the, those stories grouped in in the, in this way, it's pretty clear to me that you get a far better result. Not surprisingly, perhaps when the statesman goes to the philosopher rather than the other way around. So Socrates, uh, sorry, Socrates, yes, I guess, failed with Alcibiades, although that's actually debatable because Socrates didn't even try to change Alcibiades' mind. He just tell, told him, don't do it. And and it's not Socrates' fault if Alcibiades went, a, went ahead and did it anyway. Plato certainly failed with both of the Dionysuses. In fact, that is an interesting story in and of itself. I mean, Plato was in his 60s when he tried the first time, and in his 70s when he tries the second time. And that that was a he was an old man by the standards of the time, and he uh, had the, the the courage to take a <clears throat> fairly perilous journey 
uh, by boat from Athens to Syracuse, and just to to have this option as uh, you know this this chance, as he himself writes in one of his letters, to see if he could test his ideas about governance in practice. And so you know, kudos to Plato. I mean, he's, he's the fact that he was willing to do that sort of stuff. But Dionysus the first sells him into slavery, and Plato has to be rescued by his friends who uh, paid the the ransom. And Dionysus II basically puts him to house arrest for quite some time until eventually lets it, lets him go. So Plato almost lost his life as a result. He did succeed, however, in a in a manner uh, in a certain way with Dion. And the reason for that, I think, is because Dion was in fact one of Plato's students. He was the one that went to Plato and said, "You know, teach me. I want to learn this stuff." And Dion was fairly effective as a leader of Syracuse until, of course, he was killed by by somebody else. But you know, that's not Plato's fault. So, what we learn, I think, from those series of case studies, again, perhaps not surprisingly, is that what we need are people who are first and foremost willing to be virtuous to to improve. In, from an ethical perspective, and then want to become statesmen, leader, leaders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We don't want to just let anyone who who uh, wants to pursue that career do it, and then as an afterthought say, "Oh, by the way, I need to teach this guy some ethics because otherwise it's going to be a mess." This is also, um, in a sense, there is this evidence, there is interesting evidence from modern research that this is, in fact, problematic. Um, there was an, an interesting study that came out a few years ago, just before the beginning of the COVID pandemic, that showed that there is a high frequency of sociopathic profiles in two professions, politics and high finance. And that probably is not surprising, I suppose. Um, but it should be a warning, right? You don't want sociopaths in charge. Certainly, not a, not of high finance either, but certainly not of politics. You don't want uh, essentially, you know, what amounts to be a uh, person with a, a very deviant kind of um, psychology to be in charge of things. And yet, that's what we the, what we have a lot of the times. At the end of the book, I say that that's our own damn fault uh, because you know. Assuming that we are talking about a country that is more or less democratic, like the United States, then ultimately the buck stops with us. I mean, we are the ones that elect these people uh, to office, uh, and uh, therefore we are responsible. And I suspect that the, a major reason why we keep doing these kind of things uh, is, well, there's two major reasons. One is structural. There are, there are the way in which we have set up our political system gives incentives to the wrong people. Uh, you know, the, the fact, for instance, that you need to constantly raise money, large amounts of money, in order to be viable as a politician, uh, that turns off people that you, you might think would be good at the, at the job of politics, but not necessarily at charming people into giving them a lot of money. Also, when there is a lot of money, there is corruption, uh, inevitably. And so what we have is a systemic issue uh, that incentivizes the wrong kind of people. But we also have the fact that we as voters, as citizens, are just not paying enough attention to character, to the issue of character. Uh, hence hence the, the whole idea of the book. It is really up to us to engage both in self-improvement. You know, we, we ourselves can use a little bit of improvement in terms of, you know, ethical uh, ethical issues, but particularly to pay attention to character. Personally, I prefer, I would prefer a politician who doesn't necessarily align, whose ideas don't necessarily align with my own political preferences, preferences in terms of policy, right? But who is an honest person who really honestly tries to do uh, the best job that they can, rather than somebody who might superficially align with my policy preferences, but it turns out to be corrupted and crooked and, you know, and interested in self-aggrandizing and things like that. Uh, you know, to give you an example, I rather have, I consider myself a progressive liberal, broadly speaking, but I'd rather have a Churchill in charge than a Bill Clinton, let's say, uh, just to pick two, two, two names at, at, at random. So I do think the character is far more important than, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people seem to agree at the moment. Right. I actually agree with you about that because uh, 
I remember in an election from a few years ago, there were some candidates running uh, who I didn't entirely agree with in terms of their policies, but they were so intelligent and thoughtful and they had such good characters that uh, I would have been more than happy uh, to vote for them, especially in comparison to the candidates that we actually got. (laughs) So another problem with this too is that uh, political campaigns today are so much based on appealing to people's emotion rather than their, you know, ability to, to think critically. That's another problem. And then we also have the parties that, you know, tread out these characters uh, oftentimes just because they think that they'll be the most popular. So um, the final part of the book uh, your conclusion was really one of the most interesting parts to me because you actually lay out a short curriculum on how someone might go about developing a more virtuous character. And uh, while this is something that could be helpful to anyone, you think it would be especially helpful uh, in particular for future politicians to follow. And I was wondering if you could explain to us uh, what this curriculum is made up of and how you came up with the idea for it. So the curriculum is uh, it's a it's a self study curriculum in order to develop to engage what sometimes is referred to as the art of living. Um, the direct inspiration for it is a book called The Art of Living by um, John Sellers, uh, who is a, as you know a scholar, modern scholar of of these issues. But in fact, the idea goes back to the Renaissance and then way before that to the Greco Romans themselves. And the, the notion is that if we're talking about the theoretical part, because let's let's remember that in order to engage in ethical self-improvement, one needs a lot of practice. So the curriculum concerns itself with the theoretical part and how to do the practice, but it but then you actually have to do it. So it's you can't just read the books. But the basic idea is that there are three kinds of sources, three kinds of books that you want to concern yourself if you're serious about ethical self-improvement. One is literature that is concerned with action. So this is about the concept that we were talking about earlier about role models. Uh, How do you pick a role model? Well, you have to to study the lives of people that uh, are particularly uh, praiseworthy, that are particularly, you know, virtuous, etc. So, for instance, uh, a great source for that is the already mentioned Memorabilia by Xenophon. Uh, more broadly, Diogenes Laertius, the lives of the eminent philosophers, for instance, uh, or, um, you know, the, the parallel lives by Plutarch. All of those works are not biographies that is in that sense in which we understand the word today they're not they're not supposed to be you know about the life of these people in general they're moral biographies so the emphasis is on how did these people behave how did they live their philosophy and so an important part of one's curriculum you know self-study curriculum is to look at how philosophers how certain people embodied their philosophy and trying to do the same the second type of literature concerns you know the actual theory arguments and doctrines for instance one of the best examples here arguably is seneca's on anger that is a theoretical 3D, 3D on anger, on the specific issues of anger. It's supposed to be representative of the Stoic teachings about emotions in general. And so if you want to understand, you know, how should I deal with my emotions? Well, Seneca's on anger, it's a really good way to, to, to get, a, that get you started. And then the third type of literature that I think is useful to learn about is concerned with practical exercises or what again adult called spiritual exercises um here for instance epictetus discourses or marcus aurelius meditations are excellent examples of of how to do that that sort of stuff now the notion the idea is the curriculum that i that i present in the book in that chapter in the book is um has different phases it starts with what i think is are more approachable material and then it gets more and more challenging and it depends on how much time one actually has of course to you know to to read all of this stuff but at the very least the first round the first segment of that curriculum anybody with a few hours a week to spare uh, and an interest in in self-improvement ethical self-improvement uh, ought to be able to do it and i do think it, that is a very good way to reflect on 
what it means to um, become a better person so the theory how other people have done it and might serve as role models for you um, and how to actually do it yourself through practicing uh, the exercises right it's really interesting because uh one of the common historical interpretations of Plato's Academy is that Plato actually founded the Academy in part uh, to create more virtuous uh, political leaders. And there is a you know relatively long list of names uh, of people from ancient Greece who are associated with Plato's Academy that did become involved in uh, Greek politics. But uh, the thing that I found most interesting about your curriculum uh, to create more virtuous individuals is that you basically recreated uh, the program of study of uh, the Renaissance humanists. And I'd like to briefly explain how this curriculum came into existence because most people have sure. no idea about it. And it does also, uh, they invented the humanities and it, it does also raise some important questions about the humanities today. So uh, the inventor of Renaissance humanism was Francesco Petrarca or Petrarch, who lived in the 1300s. And he studied uh, Latin classics. His uh, favorite authors were Seneca, Cicero and Virgil. And uh, he actually wrote a letter to Seneca and said, Seneca, you would not believe uh, how often I listen to your words every day. So that was a bit shocking to read um, for someone like myself who wrote a book called Breakfast with Seneca because right. <laughs> I read Seneca every morning at breakfast, which is where the title came from. So that was a bit shocking. In any case, uh, like Seneca, actually, he was inspired by Seneca and Cicero. He wrote hundreds of letters to famous intellectuals and political leaders across Europe. And his letters were uh, often inspired by the ideas of Seneca and the style of Cicero. You can actually find places where he's like uh, reworking Seneca's ideas. But the thing about Petrarch is that he was quite learned in terms of the classics, but as he looked around himself, he was really the first person to understand how much civilization had declined since classical Roman times, especially the time right. of Cicero when Rome was still a republic. And there were a few reasons why uh, Petrarch felt that civilization had declined. Uh, one reason is that Italy was not a unified land any longer, but it consisted of like warring city-states, most of which were ruled by tyrants. You needed armed guards to travel through the countryside. Uh, another reason is that the Latin language over the course of a thousand years had grown incredibly corrupt. And later on, the humanists wanted to recapture being able to write in the you know pure style of Cicero. That was one of their obsessions. Another thing yeah. is that Petrarch was uh, a devout Christian, and he saw the Catholic Church as being incredibly corrupt. In the 1300s, the papal seat had moved out of Rome to southern France, and that's where Petrarch's father worked. And Petrarch had a lot of inside contacts there, and he referred to the Catholic Church there as the Western Babylon and a nest of fornicators. So those are quotes. <laughs> So, yeah, he did, uh, he did not mince words. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> he did not. And uh, he was pretty well informed about this. Uh, another item, too, is that the legal system had become um, very corrupt. He felt it had been great in Roman times, but in Petrarch's time, uh, it had become an arcane system that sold justice. So he was a law school dropout, like a lot of the later uh, Renaissance humanists. But basically, he saw this massive cultural decline that happened since the fall of Rome. And Petrarch actually invented the idea of the Dark Ages to explain this. Mm -hmm. And right. this is the key point. Uh, he came to the conclusion that the only way to improve the world in which he lived was to rediscover the deepest values of classical civilization. And the only way to create better political leaders was to restore the moral philosophy of the ancient world. And that was the birth of the Renaissance. It was to recover the, the lost knowledge of antiquity and the moral philosophy of the ancient world. And this resulted in the invention of the humanities. And one thing that you have to keep in mind for Petrarch is that 
his idea of moral philosophy was stoicism and Greek virtue ethics, which is exactly what you're talking about. And so this should sound familiar to you because it's exactly the same uh, topic that you're exploring in your book. That's right. And I and I do think that Petrarch and the other humanists, Renaissance humanists, were exactly right. I mean, often when I have these kind of conversations like we're having today, one question that naturally comes to uh into these conversations is why why the greco romans you know why why do we listen to people or read people that are you know more than 2000 years old and of course often that is accompanied by and by the way these were all white men and like yeah whatever it the the, the point is that you want to listen to the greco roman and not just the greco romans uh, there are other traditions from about the same time as it turns out you know buddhism in India, for instance, Confucianism and Taoism in China, which is about the same time, maybe a century or two older uh, than the Greco-Roman traditions, where these people actually got something fundamentally right <laughs> about human nature, about ethics understood in the broad sense as, as the problem of how to live harmoniously and productively with other people. They just got something right. And so why you want to throw it away uh, just because it's, it's, it's old? You know, it's not, it's not that the latest thing is necessarily the better just because it is the latest. Now, when you talk a minute ago, you mentioned the, the word knowledge, right? So that Petrarch was trying to, to, uh, re, um, resume uh, and, and reevaluate, reevaluate ancient knowledge. That word is interesting because so if, if we were having a conversation today, not about ethics and justice and stuff like that, but about, let's say, physics and biology, we wouldn't be talking about the Greco-Romans. I wouldn't advise, as a biologist myself, I wouldn't advise somebody who wants to study biology today, say, well, go back to Aristotle and read what he was and really have to say. Unless you're interested in histor historically, you know, in the history of science, that's fine. But if you want to learn biology from Aristotle or physics from Aristotle, you really are wasting your time. That the modern modern science and modern technology are so different and so much more advanced than what the Greco-Romans or the Indians or the Chinese were doing at the time. That it makes no sense to, for you to, to to approach it that way. But I think interestingly, in terms of ethics, not only these people got something fundament important fundamentally right but in fact i would argue i would go as far as arguing that modern moral philosophy made a couple of really seriously wrong turns over the last couple of uh, hundred years beginning with kant arguably i think that both kant and later on uh you know john stuart mill and jeremy bentham so the founders of utilitarianism they just went in the wrong direction and we, we're now in modern times we're thinking of ethics as uh, essentially the study of right and wrong the, the, the and, and and we're thinking of it as a universal as as being rooted in universal answers there is only one answer to is this action right or is this action wrong and that's about all we're concerned about the ancients had a much broader view of ethics as i said for them ethics was not just the study of right and wrong although it did include that it was the study of how to live a flourishing human life, a good human life. So it includes everything, your priorities, your values, you know, how you make choices, how you interact with other people, how you treat yourself, that is how to interact with yourself. All of that, most of it, of that sort of stuff, it's actually missing from modern ethics. And the other thing is an ancient virtue ethics, and again, I'm, I'm including here also non-Western traditions where people have argued, for instance, that Confucianism is a kind of virtue ethics as well, fairly similar to Aristotelian virtue ethics. The, the point of virtue ethics is that um, often the answer to any particular question uh, that has ethical salience is it depends. It depends not in the sense that it's, this is not a relativist answer. Not, not, you know, your opinion is just as good as mine, but it depends on the circumstances. The very same action can be virtuous or non-virtuous, depending on the circumstances, and even depending on the intentions of the actor himself or herself. Like, for instance, if I decide to uh, go and, and volunteer for the local soup kitchen, is that a good action or not? Now, I think a Kantian would say, yes, it is. You have a moral duty to help other people. End of story. A utilitarian would say, well, let's do the calculations here. If what you're doing improves most people's happiness, then it's a good thing. If it doesn't, then it's not a good thing. So those are 
rigid universal answers. A virtual ethicist would start by answering, by asking me, why are you doing this? And if it turns out that if the answer is I'm doing it because I generally want to help other people, then yes, that's a virtuous action, even though I may fail. I might volunteer for the uh, for the soup kitchen, and then it turns out the soup kitchen today is closed, or they have too many volunteers already, and so they turn me down. It doesn't matter. The action was still purchased. But if I'm doing it, let's say, because I need an additional line on my resume so that I'm going to have better chances to find a job, that's not a virtuous action. Even if I succeed, even if I actually help people in the process, it's not a virtuous action. And I find that way of looking at things far more interesting and far more useful than either the Kantian or the utilitarian approaches. Exactly. <clears throat> so there's that element of uh, self-interest that you have to be uh, careful about. Um, I do want to make one final point, which is uh, about how people no longer understand what the humanities originally meant, because the humanities were basically invented by the Renaissance humanists, and they created what's what was called the Studia Humanitatis, which was based on the kinds of studies Petrarch was engaged in. And that consisted of, uh, there were five subjects, uh, the study of Latin, um, rhetoric, persuasive speaking. Um, that was important politically because like Florence was a free republic. So uh, they wanted to convince people through their eloquence and reasoning. And then uh, what else? Uh, uh, history, poetry, and uh, moral philosophy. But all of these were subservient to moral philosophy because the original goal of the humanities was to improve people's characters. So this is the subject of your book. And to create better people. And so they came up with the exact kind of curriculum that you're talking about. Now, I thought it was really interesting because you said, well, um, people following your curriculum, they should read the parallel lives of Plutarch because these give us examples of, you know, morally virtuous people. Well, Petrarch actually wrote a book called uh, On Illustrious Men because uh, that was his own take on it because um, Plutarch would not be uh, translated, you know, for like, you know, like 150 years later, quite a long time later. But uh, I think it's very telling that no one really knows what the humanities are about anymore. If you right. ask a humanities professor, they might say, well, it's to teach us critical thinking. And of course, critical thinking is good. But if you went around on the campus, uh, you know, where you teach and you, you ask people, you know, what was the original purpose of the humanities? I doubt that anyone could tell you that it was uh, to improve people's characters and to create better people. I just exactly. don't see that as being part of it. I absolutely, and, and that's that's why we're now into the paradoxical situation where it used to be that if you wanted to improve your character, you go to a philosopher. A philosopher understood not as an academic with a PhD who spends most of his life working on very abstruse and very narrow matters, but somebody who tries to practice the art of living. Today, the last place you want to go if you if you are into ethical self improvement is a philosophy department because people will look at you as like, what the hell are you talking about? This is this is not what we do, and that's unfortunate. I think that's unfortunate. I think there is no inherent contradiction between the two meanings of the word philosopher. One could certainly be a philosopher in the academic sense, and you know, just like you can be a scientist in the in the academic sense or or an engineer, anything, uh, and at the same time however, try to live your life as a philosopher. Uh, you, you probably know this uh, series of studies that came out a few years ago uh, where they uh, people looked into how ethic, just how ethical professors of moral philosophy are compared to other academics. And it turns out, not more at all. Uh, the, the good news is at least they were not less ethical than other than other academics, but they were not more ethical either, which tells you right there, you know, when I read that thing, I, I actually couldn't believe it. When, when I read that, the, the first paper, and it's, this is a series of papers that are published in an area that's called experimental philosophy, which basically is a social science approach to philosophical issues. And when I read that paper, I thought, no, that, that's, that's got to be a, a problem with the experimental design. You know, I'm a scientist myself. So the first thing, when I don't believe something, when I'm skeptical about something, the first place I go is, 
let me take a look at the experimental setup and the data analysis. These people must have gotten something wrong. But no, they didn't. The reality is that today one can be a teacher of moral philosophy, of ethics, know all the intricacies of everything that has been said uh, about ethics and yet not be more ethical himself or herself. And that to me is stunning. And it is something that really needs to change. We, we, we need to yeah, well, Seneca about. had the same complaint, actually, in one of his letters. He talks about how, you know, professional uh, philosophers have all of these, you know, high sounding theories, but they don't actually apply them in their own lives. Or as we would say today, they don't really walk the talk <laughs> in terms right, of what exactly. they're saying. And Epictetus has the same problem, which the, you know he, he says to some of his students, like if you, if you came here to just learn the the logic, the, the intricacies of the logic of Chrysippus, for instance, uh, you are just doing the philosophical equivalent of equivalent of literary criticism, but you're not actually learning anything that. You're not learning logic in order to live a better life. You're just learning logic for logic's sake. And that's and then you're wasting my time, basically. So yeah, this is not a not a new problem. This is another one of those things that has been around for a couple of thousand years. Right. Um, well, I'd like to just briefly uh, talk about a project that I'm uh, working on that re relates to this, because what I've come to believe is that in the same way that the people in the Renaissance look back to the Greek philosophers in terms of creating, you know, a more virtuous world that we can actually do the same in terms of drawing upon the ideas of the Renaissance, because they really excelled in this area as well. And they were able to recover uh, not only philosophy, but a lot of other forms of lost knowledge, such as uh, the principles of architecture and creating a much better world. So um, I think that we can also learn from uh, the Renaissance thinkers so I started a new website called Living Ideas Journal, and uh, related to this is a five-day course that I'm teaching in uh, Florence in May, which is called Creating the Best Possible World, the Energizing Ideas of the Italian Renaissance. So it covers nice. a lot of the key ideas of uh, the Renaissance, and then we can go look at the different uh, things that the Renaissance thinkers and artists created to see how those ideas were manifest and so uh, i was also wondering are you working on any on any uh, current projects that you could tell us about yeah i'm actually about to go on sabbatical at the end of this semester uh, i will take a, a year of sabbatical which uh, is uh, one of those rare opportunities that academics have and other people don't of taking a whole year uh, of teaching, of administrative duties, of anything, and just work on a particular project. In my case, the project will be a, a new book, not surprisingly, <laughs> uh, the provisional title of which is The Happy Skeptic. And the book is going to be about skepticism, spe specifically about the kind of academic skepticism that uh, flourished for a little bit during, in, in the late well, middle Platonic uh, Academy, period of the Platonic Academy. And the guide to, uh, throughout the book, the guide to that kind of skepticism will be Cicero. So the book is about skepticism and Cicero, and I will be spending some time traveling uh, throughout the Mediterranean, sort of tracking down basically all the major locations where Cicero spent his life. This is not going to be a biography of Cicero. There's already a couple of interesting, there's one very, very nice biography of Cicero out there. So this is not going to be, be a biography. It's really a book about philosophy and specifically, as I said, about skepticism. But we do need a guide. So when I wrote How to Be a Stoic, uh, I picked Epictetus as my guide. And in this case, I'll pick Cicero. I think Cicero is an excellent example of the kind of practical philosopher we've been talking about. Arguably, in some respects, and maybe that's going to be a different conversation that the two of us can have at some other time, arguably even better than, than Socrates. And the reason I'm saying this is because Cicero was not just a philosopher like Socrates, but was also an actual politician. He, he rose to the rank of consul, which was the highest political office in Republican Rome, and a public advocate, in other words, a lawyer. And so he knew uh, about the intricacies of practical philosophy and of actually running a state and not, not just you know thinking about it. And one of the things that, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to read you this this quote uh, that Cicero, uh, from, from one of Cicero's letters to his friend Atticus, his lifelong friend Atticus. Cicero was frustrated at some point with Cato the Younger. 
the uh, stoic senator because Cato was uh, had a reputation for high level of integrity, but he was also very rigid. He also applied his philosophy straight in a way that it was not compromising. And Cicero thought that, that if you're into the, in the business of politics, that is in the business of getting things done, you need to compromise. And so he wrote to Atticus, he says, as for our friend Cato, you do not love him more than I do. But after all, with the very best intentions and the most absolute honesty, he sometimes does harm to the Republic. He speaks and votes as though he were in the Republic of Plato, not in the scum of Romulus. <laughs> and I love that sentence. It's like, now, my friend, we're not in Plato's Republic. We're not, this is not utopia. This is the scum of Romulus. Romulus, of course, being the legendary founder of Rome. This is r the real world. And so Cicero really embodies, in my mind, the ideal of a practical philosopher, somebody who did have a moral compass, who did try to do the right thing, but at the same time was also aware of the fact that he lived in the scum of Romulus and he had needed to get things done. And that sometimes means compromising. Right. I just want to tell you uh, or mention how uh, incredibly important this point was for the Renaissance, because this knowledge of Cicero as being very actively involved in daily political life and things like that had been totally lost during medieval times. But um, Petrarch was obsessed with Cicero and finding all these ancient manuscripts, and he discovered Cicero's lost letters of Attic to Atticus. And if it hadn't been to Petrarch, we would have never found them. And actually, when uh, Petrarch read them, his heart was broken because <laughs> he had this vision of uh, Cicero as this, uh, you know, philosopher who lived in an ivory tower and sat in his uh, country villas and wrote philosophy. And he was so disappointed to see that uh, Cicero got his hands dirty with political matters and things like that. But later on, this became the model for the Renaissance and the basis of what scholars now call civic humanism. And uh, I refer to it by the phrase of creating the best possible world, because that really explains what they were trying to do. And Cicero was the model of both being philosophically engaged, but also engaged in the world of society. And that became the model for the Renaissance and allowed the Renaissance to flower forth the way that it did. So Cicero ended up being uh, the biggest hero of the civic humanists of the Renaissance. That's right. And, and so here we are again. Yeah. It's a perennial yeah, topic yeah. and you're exploring the same thing. It's really amazing. And uh, it does give me some hope for the world. Uh, we need to think about these things. And Massimo, uh, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for this uh, conversation. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. And uh, if people have enjoyed this, uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and select the notifications bell so you can learn about new discussions in the future. And also uh, look under the video on YouTube because I'm going to post Massimo's link to his book and his website and also the projects that I'm working on. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's wonderful speaking with you and hopefully we'll speak again soon. Mm -hmm.